Hi, my name is Dr. Jacob Levy. Welcome to uh, USMLE Step 3, Review for Neurology. Um, what we're going to be doing today is basically we're going to be uh, going through a number of cases and uh, what I'm going to emphasize is sort of a, an interactive kind of style of lecturing where I'm going to be posing a lot of questions and I'm going to uh, ask you to think about those questions um, and uh, in that way I feel the material is a little bit more, uh, stays in your head a little bit more actively and a little bit more um, uh, securely, and I think you'll get a lot more out of the uh, out of the uh, presentation. Uh, so let's go on to the first case. Okay, uh, case number one. The chief complaint is I'm having a hard time seeing Doc. So you have a 57 year old man who comes to the emergency room with several days of increasing confusion, blurriness of vision, nausea, and an unsteady gait. He also complains that objects seem to be shaking when he looks at them. He signed out of an alcoholic detoxification unit several days ago. He was over halfway through a phenobarbital regimen when he left, and he vehemently denies any alcohol use since he left the detox unit because he has constantly been at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. His only other past medical history is for seizures that are not related to his drinking and probably stem from repeated head trauma while intoxicated. His only medication is phenytoin. So the, the chief complaint is, I'm having a hard time seeing Doc. So when you have a chief complaint, it's very, very important when you approach these cases and when you approach uh, these questions on the USMLE Step 3 is to have a good differential diagnosis for the patient's chief complaint. And then based upon your differential diagnosis, you can sort of look for specific testing, specific signs on physical diagnosis, specific facts in the history to help you know, pare down your list of differential diagnosis and get to a final diagnosis. And once you made the final diagnosis, you can decide what to do with treatment, what to do with management, and so on. So the first question you have to ask yourself in any patient who has any complaint is what is a good differential for this particular complaint? So in a 57-year-old man who comes with difficulty seeing, you have to think of the following things. Especially if he is an alcoholic, you have to think about alcoholic intoxication. intoxication. He is a gentleman who has a history of drinking a lot of alcohol, who has a history of using substances, of using drugs, and you have to think about the possibility that even though he is telling you that, he is never, that he's not using alcohol anymore or he's not taking any drugs, that this is a possible cause or a possible explanation for his, uh, for his symptoms. So you always have to think about alcohol intoxication. That's the first or the main thing that you have to consider in your differential diagnosis. Now, confusion, blurriness of vision, nausea, unsteady gait, basically point you towards ataxia. And ataxia, in combination with blurry vision, you can think about an acute stroke to the cerebellum or any sort of cerebellar lesion that may give you these symptoms. Now, um, the history of being on phenytoin is also something that could account for his ataxia and could account for his blurriness of vision. He can have very, very bad nystagmus with ataxia secondary, secondary to phenytoin intoxication. So these are sort of the things that you have to consider when you're dealing with somebody who's coming and complaining of blurriness of vision and also complaining of ataxia, nausea, and vomiting. So how, what would be your best and what would, what, would, what would your initial diagnostic plan be? Well, first of all, you'd want to look at the physical examination. The physical examination will give you a tremendous amount of information to differentiate these basic uh, differential diagnoses. For example, an alcohol intoxication, you would look for confusion, lethargy, basically somebody who looks drunk. Most of us have seen a drunk person, have either been drunk themselves or have seen a drunk person in their lifetime, and you can tell when somebody is actually drunk. Now, if you're looking for a cerebrovascular accident or a bleed in the cerebellum, you would look for posterior circulation signs consistent with the stroke in that area, and that basically is cranial nerve deficits, and you would look for extraocular movements being intact or not intact. You could also look for focal neurologic signs. 
For example, a hemiparesis, weakness in the leg, any sign that may imply that there is a mass lesion in the brain, either vascular or neoplastic, that in addition to uh, alcohol intoxication or, or in addition to a general in addition to a general sort of uh, intoxication causing his symptoms. You would also look for nystagmus. Now, nystagmus is important because it can imply either a peripheral lesion causing his nausea and his vomiting and possibly his vertigo, or it can imply a central lesion. Now, how do you differentiate between nystagmus secondary to peripheral disease, like Meniere's disease, like labyrinthitis, like benign positional paroxysmal vertigo or nystagmus, and nystagmus secondary to central disease, for example, brain tumor in the cerebellum or a large bleed in the cerebellum. Now, you differentiate the two simply by the characteristics of the nystagmus. In peripheral disease, the nystagmus is unidirectional. Now, what does that mean that the nystagmus is unidirectional? It means that no matter which direction the patient is looking, the nystagmus will always be in the, will, will always be in the same direction. Will always be in the same direction. And that is the fast component of the nystagmus will be to the opposite side of the lesion. So for example, if a patient has Meniere's disease and the side of the ear is affected the right ear is affected, the nystagmus will always be to the left, even if the patient is looking to the right. And the, the, the direction of the stagmus will not change whether the patient is looking to the right, to the left, up or down. It is unidirectional. In central disease, the nystagmus tends to be multidirectional, meaning as the patient looks to the left or looks to the right, the nystagmus will change direction. Nystagmus in peripheral disease generally will be uh, suppressed with fixation. And when you ask the patient to look at your finger, or you ask a patient to look at one particular object, to fixate on something, the nystagmus will go away. In central nystagmus, the nystagmus will not be suppressed with fixation, but rather will be consistent despite the fact that the patient is fixating on your finger or on an object. Additionally, central nystagmus generally will come with neighborhood signs. Patients will, patients will have dysarthria, dysphagia, cranial nerve deficits in addition to the nystagmus. And in peripheral disease, the nystagmus does not generally come with neighborhood signs, i.e. a focal neurologic deficit or dysarthria or dysphagia. So if you have neighborhood signs, it's consistent with a central cause of the nystagmus. If you do not have neighborhood signs, it implies more peripheral cause. Now in addition, Peripheral nystagmus will never be pure. Meaning, if you have pure horizontal nystagmus or pure vertical nystagmus, it implies that it is a central cause. In peripheral nystagmus, you will have a horizontal and a vertical component or a rotatory component with a horizontal component. You never have pure nystagmus in one direction or the other in peripheral disease. Additionally, in peripheral disease, you usually have tinnitus and hearing loss. If you have tinnitus associated, associated with the nystagmus and you have hearing loss associated with the nystagmus, then it implies a peripheral cause. If you don't have tinnitus and you don't have hearing loss, it implies more a central cause of the vertigo or a central cause of the nystagmus. Also, the onset of the disease can imply whether it's central or peripheral. Peripheral nystagmus or vertigo is generally acute onset, whereas nystagmus secondary to a bleed, secondary to a tumor or uh, a chronic process generally occurs slowly over time and will worsen over many month period. So it's very, very important when you're looking at nystagmus, to ask yourself, is this consistent with central disease or is this consistent with peripheral disease? So, we look at the physical exam and the patient is afebrile. He has a blood pressure of 126 over 82, respiratory rate of 12, and a pulse of 78. 
is mildly obese and no distress with slurred speech. So here he has both horizontal and vertical nystagmus. The rapid phase of the vertical nystagmus is upwards. He's mildly lethargic and oriented. He has ataxia. He has finger to nose and heel to shin testing, which are dysmetric, which is consistent with cerebellar disease. However, he has basically a non-focal neurologic exam. He has ataxia. He has dysmetria. But he doesn't have any focal neurologic deficit. No sensory deficit and no motor deficit. And some dysarthria. So again, our differential diagnosis is phenytoin toxicity, alcohol intoxication, barbiturate intoxication, cerebellar lesion, a vestibular or inner ear defect, which would be things like labyrinthitis, Meniere's disease, benign positional vertigo, vestibular nerve defect, or a physiologic nystagmus. It's very important to differentiate between central and peripheral, like we stated earlier. So what is your initial diagnostic plan going to be? Again, this is a gentleman who has a history of alcohol abuse. So you have to rule out alcohol intoxication. This is a patient who is on phenytoin, and you have to rule out phenytoin overdose as a cause of this gentleman's symptoms. This is also a gentleman who is 57 years old and who is entitled to have a stroke in his cerebellum or a bleed in his cerebellum. So with that in mind, your initial diagnostic plan is going to, get, is, is going to be to get an alcohol level because that is the way that you're going to rule out alcohol intoxication. A phenytoin level will rule out phenytoin intoxication. Urine toxicology will give you an idea about any other drugs that he may be taking. Now, serum chemistries are taken simply because you want to make sure that he doesn't have any hyponatremia, hypocalcemia. Even though these as causes of his symptoms are very less likely, you'd want to consider them as possible causes. And what comes back of you in the results? He has a high level of phenytoin. And his symptoms are not secondary to alcohol intoxication, but rather secondary to phenytoin overdose. So in summary, when you have a patient who's coming and complaining of vertigo, blurry vision, and ataxia, you have to consider central vertigo and nystagmus versus peripheral vertigo and nystagmus. And you do that by the physical exam. In central nystagmus, it is non-suppressible with fixation can be, if it is pure, very specific for a central cause. Comes with neighborhoods, neighborhood signs, i.e. dysarthria, dysphagia, focal neurologic deficit. Peripheral nystagmus and vertigo is unidirectional, will not change depending on the direction that the patient is looking, is associated with tinnitus and hearing loss, usually is mixed and is suppressed with fixation. So the final diagnosis in the first case is phenytoin toxicity. The treatment would be to stop the drug until his levels become therapeutic but not toxic. Let's go on to the second case. Case two. Chief complaint. My back hurts. The patient is a 55-year-old woman with chronic back pain and a history of breast cancer. The back pain has recently become worse after doing some heavy lifting during spring cleaning. She also complains that pain radiates around her body like a tight belt. The pain has continued to increase and she has gone from using increasing amounts of ibuprofen over the last week to an oxycodone and an acetaminophen combination. So when you're evaluating a patient with back pain, the essential, the essential um, question you have to ask yourself is as follows. Is this spinal cord compression? Is this a neurologic emergency that has to be dealt with now? Or is this chronic back pain that I can treat with analgesia or general analgesics and watch over a period of time? Now, how do I make this differentiation between chronic back pain, which is non-emergent, 
and spinal cord compression, which is emergent. Well, I take a history, and then I do a physical exam. Now, what are the points on the history that I need to look for to rule out spinal cord compression? Well, I'm going to be looking at a history of cancer. Any patient who has a history of breast cancer, any patient who has a history of lung cancer, or prostate cancer, or colon cancer, or any cancer that can metastasize to bone, you have to consider the possibility of spinal cord compression when they complain of back pain. And that should be your working diagnosis until proven otherwise. So this is a 55-year-old woman with chronic back pain who also has a history of breast cancer. And her back pain has recently worsened. Do not make the mistake of writing off her worsening back pain because you are given a history of heavy lifting during spring cleaning. The consequences of missing spinal cord compression are horrific for the patient and horrific, and horrific for, the, for the physician as well. It is extremely, extremely important that when you have a history of cancer and a, and a history of worsening back pain or back pain at all, that you exclude metastatic disease to the vertebra causing spinal cord compression. So simply by the fact that she has a history of breast cancer makes your, should raise your level of suspicion regarding the emergency of her back pain. Now she is also complaining of pain that radiates around her body like a tight belt. Now when pain radiates in a dermatomal distribution around her body, meaning it's not lancing down the back of her leg, it's not localized to one side of her back, but it's radiating around her body implying a, implying a dermatomal distribution. That implies that there is spinal cord involvement. Now you can also ask about bladder and bowel function. Patients who have spinal cord compression have bladder incontinence and bowel incontinence and they also have sexual dysfunction. So if a 55-year-old woman with chronic back pain and a history of breast, ca breast cancer comes into the emergency room complaining of back pain with a dermatomal distribution to her pain, meaning the pain radiates around her body like a tight belt, also complaining of bladder incontinence or urinary incontinence and fecal incontinence with sexual dysfunction and bilateral lower extremity weakness, these are all signs on physical exam and history that this patient is having a, an emergent, an emergent spinal cord compression. Now this is considered to be a neurologic emergency and you have to address, you have to address this emergency, you have to address this situation like an emergency because if you don't, the patient can become paraplegic and can no longer, and there is a possibility that she will lose the ability to walk. So the key points in the history are a history of breast cancer, pain radiating around her body, bowel incontinence, fecal incontinence, sexual dysfunction with lower extremity weakness bilaterally implies spinal cord compression. Now what are other causes of spinal cord compression besides metastatic disease? Patients can have herniated discs her, a herniated disc causing spinal cord compression. Patients can have epidural abscesses causing spinal cord compression. There also can be hematomas or blood causing spinal cord compression. And how do you differentiate between these various differential diagnoses? Simply by the history. If a patient has a history of breast cancer, think about malignancy compressing the spinal cord. If a patient has point tenderness, a history of bacteremia, low-grade fever or fever with a white cell count, think about an epidural abscess or osteomyelitis compressing the spinal cord. If a patient has a history of trauma to the area, think about, think about a hematoma actually compressing the spinal cord. If a patient has a history of chronic back pain but no history of cancer and a history of spinal cord, uh, uh, a spinal cord operation or a history of uh, any kind of chronic back pain without breast cancer, without a history of cancer, you can think about a herniated disc. You can think about a herniated disc.
So what is the best initial diagnostic test when you're evaluating a patient with back pain? The best initial diagnostic test is an x-ray. That is a test which can be done quickly. It is a test that can be done fairly quickly and fairly uh, rapidly in the emergency room, and it can give you an idea of what you're dealing with. What is the most sensitive test in dealing with a patient with acute back pain or spinal cord compression? The answer is MRI. So MRI of the spine is the most sensitive test. The best initial test is x-ray. Now, in this particular patient, what would be the next step in the management of this patient? Would you do an x-ray? Would you, dic- would you send the patient for an MRI? Would you give the patient steroids? The answer is, is that you would give the patient steroids. Because if you make the determination that this patient is having acute spinal cord compression, you have to definitively treat that spinal cord compression before you make a diagnosis. So if by clinical exam, on physical exam, she has hyperreflexia in her lower extremities, she has weakness, bladder incontinence, urinary incontinence, uh, fecal incontinence, and you've made the clinical diagnosis of spinal cord compression in a 55-year-old woman with breast cancer, you must treat with steroids before you send the patient for any diagnostic, any diagnostic, uh, any diagnostic uh, testing. So let's look at the f- physical exam. She has spinal tenderness over the lower thoracic spine. She has poor effort on a motor exam due to pain. Now, the increased tone in the lower extremities is actually an upper motor neuron. It's an actually upper motor neuron sign. Now, when you have a myelopathy, which is disease of the spinal cord, you will get lower motor, lower motor neuron signs at the level of the myopathy, and at, the, and at anything below the pathology, you will actually get upper motor neuron signs. So she's having increased tone in the lower extremities. She has increased deep tendon reflexes, and she has plantar responses extensor bilaterally. And those are all upper motor neuron signs. And these are all consistent with a spinal cord lesion at T10, where she has her sensory level, and any, any level below T10, in terms of the motor function, will show, will show upper motor neuron signs. So, The differential diagnosis, like we said, was metastatic cancer, locally developing cancer, though very, very rare, epidural abscess, epidural hematoma, or herniated discs. Herniated disc. Those are your basic differential diagnosis. So the initial diagnostic plan is a chest X-ray and a spinal X-ray. Now, why are you getting the chest X-ray? Well, sometimes you can see on the chest X-ray uh, lesions in the, you can see evidence of metastatic disease which would be consistent. The best initial test in this particular case, because she has hyperreflexia, because she has increased tone and positive Lubinsky bilaterally, is a spinal x ray. And it shows destruction of the vertebral body at T10. So the best initial step in the management of this patient with acute spinal cord compression is to give dexamethasone. And the idea behind giving the steroids is to actually decrease the swelling caused by the tumor, to decrease the swelling caused by the tumor and and hopefully improve the neurologic deficit. Hopefully improve the neurologic deficit. The best initial diagnostic test is a spinal x-ray. The most sensitive test is MRI of the spine. Now, the MRI will help you in terms of the ultimate treatment of the compression. If a patient has a hematoma or a patient has a herniated disc and has spinal cord compression, the treatment will be surgical, meaning you will ask a neurosurgeon to come in and decompress the spinal cord, surgically. If, however, a patient has metastatic disease, you can consider radiation to the area to shrink the tumor and help and help the compression, or help relieve the compression. So basically, an acute spinal cord compression, or any patient with back pain, 
If you have a history of cancer, you have to rule out spinal cord compression. How do you rule out spinal cord compression? By history and physical exam. If a patient has lower extremity weakness, urinary incontinence, fecal incontinence, then you have to consider spinal cord compression. Best initial diagnostic test is spinal x-ray. Most sensitive test is MRI. The best initial step in the management of this patient when you suspect this diagnosis is steroids. Let's go on to the next case. Case number three. Chief complaint. My eyelids are drooping and I am seeing double. History. The patient is a 54-year-old man who has noticed a drooping of his eyelids and a problem with double vision that occurs late in the day. He has noted difficulty finishing dinner because of fatigue. Now, what is the most likely diagnosis in a 54-year-old man who complains of drooping, drooping eyelids, double vision, dysphagia in, with dinner but not in breakfast that occurs later in the day? Patient who, patients who, a patient who comes and complains of neurologic deficits that occur after many, many hours, that occur later in the day, the most likely diagnosis is myasthenia gravis. Now, what is myasthenia gravis? Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease that, is a, that, that basically has, is defined as antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. And in that way, the patient's voluntary movement or use of his skeletal muscle is compromised. So myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease characterized by antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor diagnosed clinically by progressive weakness with effort. And that is why this patient has drooping eyelids. He is seeing double. And, that, and his symptoms only occur after many, many hours of the day. When he wakes up in the morning, he's fine. Only after his eyes have to stay open for many, many hours. Only after he has to, uh, he, he's awake and he's using his, his voluntary muscles for swallowing through the whole day, or he's using his extraocular muscles for movement of his eyes during the whole day, does he get weakness. This is myasthenia gravis. Now, how do we make the diagnosis of myasthenia gravis? When they ask you on the USMLE what the best initial test is, you will answer one of the following. The best initial test is either the Tensilon which test, which is when we give a short-acting anticholinesterase medication, which raises the level of acetylcholine in the synapse, and uses those receptors that are available more often, giving a transient improvement in the weakness. So a tensilon test is very, very sensitive, but not really specific, which is why it's a good which is why it is a good initial test. You can get falsely positive tensilon tests with diseases like amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. So it's not very it's not very specific but it is very sensitive. Another initial diagnostic test you could use is antibodies. Patients who have generalized myasthenia, 90, over 90% of them will have positive antibodies to the acetylcholine receptor. If they only have ocular myasthenia gravis, the, the sensitivity and the specificity goes down to approximately 50%. Now, what is the best test or most sensitive test or most accurate test for the diagnosis of myasthenia? The answer to that is, to ele is electromyography. And there you look at the, uh, the, uh, the, the degree of muscle contraction and as the patient repeatedly contracts his muscle, the, the, the level or the amplitude of the contraction will go down. And if you see improvement after you give an, acetyl, a, 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 an anticholinesterase inhibitor, it's diagnostic of the disease. So the best initial test is tensilon or antibodies. The most sensitive test is electromyography. And on physical, and, and on physical exam, you see progressive weakening with recurrent effort in using the muscles. 
Now, myasthenia gravis has to be differentiated from Eaton Lambert syndrome, Eaton Lambert myasthenic, myasthenic syndrome. Now, what is the difference clinically between Eaton Lambert and myasthenia? Is that myasthenia you get progressive weakness with repeated effort, and in Eaton Lambert it is the opposite. You get progressive strengthening with repeated effort. Now, Eaton Lambert syndrome is usually seen as a paraneoplastic syndrome associated with small cell carcinoma of the lung. Myasthenia gravis is an autoimmune disease usually associated with other autoimmune diseases like hypothyroidism. So again, clinically, myasthenia on, re on repetitive effort gives you improve, uh, worsening of your strength or weakening on recurrent effort. Eaton Lambert is the opposite and will give you improved strength with recurrent effort. Eaton Lambert is associated with perineo, is a perineoplastic syndrome associated with small cell or oat cell carcinoma of the lung. And myasthenia is primarily an autoimmune disease. So what is the best, what's the next step in the management of any patient who comes in complaining of weakness and you suspect myasthenia gravis? The first thing that you have to do in a myasthenic crisis is to determine the respiratory function of a patient. Meaning as the myasthenic crisis gets worse and worse and worse, the ability of the patient to, to breathe, the strength of his diaphragm will actually weaken and his vital capacity will go down and down and down. And they can actually die of respiratory failure. Now, this concern with respiratory status is important in other, in other, in other uh, diseases where you have weakening muscles. For example, Guillain-Barre, you have to be concerned about the vital capacity and the respiratory status. Botulism, you have to be concerned about the respiratory status and the vital capacity. So in any patient who comes in with myasthenic crisis, you must measure the vital capacity and if the vital capacity is low, or there is evidence of carbon dioxide retention on the blood gas, or the patient is complaining of shortness of breath, you must consider intubation to prevent imminent death. Now, how do we treat myasthenia? We treat myasthenia symptomatically, and we also treat the autoimmune components of the disease. So for the symptomatic relief of the disease we give, anticholinesterase medications like neostigmine. And th in that way, the patients hopefully get better or feel stronger. But we also have to suppress the autoimmune phenomena. And how do we suppress the autoimmune phenomena? We give steroids. We give azathioprine. We, give, we do plasmapheresis in the acute exacerbation. So the treatment of myasthenia is both symptomatic and suppression of the autoimmune phenomena. Now, most patients with myasthenia need to have a CAT scan. Why do they need to have a CAT scan? Because you need to rule out thymoma. Patients who have thymoma, if you do a thymectomy, if you take out the thymus, 85% of those patients' myasthenia will actually improve. In addition to which, patients with myasthenia have a higher rate of malignant thymoma. And when you take out the thymus, you're actually prophylactically protecting the patient from the development of malignant tumor. So we do the thymectomy. Why? To improve the symptoms, but also to prophylactically remove a potential source of a malignant tumor in these patients. Again, myasthenia. The best initial diagnostic test is tensilon or antibody. The most sensitive test is electromyography. Treatment is both symptomatic with anticholinesterase medications and against the autoimmune phenomena with steroids and as a thioprene or immunosuppressive disease. You have to consider always the respiratory status of these patients when they present. And Eaton-Lambert is distinguished from myasthenia basically by the clinical picture of improving strength with, repetitive, with, with repeated effort.
So on physical exam, this patient has unequally drooping eyelids, immobile mouth, his, his mouth resembles a snarl more than anything else, he has weakness of his levator palpebrae, and he has weakness of eye closure. Differential diagnosis is myasthenia gravis, Lambert-Eaton, aminoglucoside antibiotics in large doses, botulism and periodic paralysis.